All right, I'm going to get started. Um, my name is Anthony Horn. I am a user experience designer at UC Davis, IET's web development department. And I got some fun stuff that we've won in the past up there. There's a Webby People's Choice Award for our UC Davis.edu site, which was pretty, we're pretty proud of that. Uh, we got some Souter Awards for our site farm community. Um, and UC, the UC Tech Slack seems to be a good place to find UC people, so um, got that on there. Uh, what we're going to learn today. So we're going to look at the current UX improvement process that uh, we're using in IET Web Dev. Um, and we are going to take a look at that process as it applies to a real project. Then we're going to look at how you can do something similar. And finally, we're going to talk just a little bit about the community. <coughs> so let's take a look at what our process looks like currently. So this is kind of like a high level overview of our process. Uh, we do, you know, we take our client through this. You know, someone comes to us and says, we want to do user experience uh, improvement. And I say, great, let's start this process. Here's what we're looking at. Some sort of design challenge, and we're going to go through some, some meetings, and we're going to figure out uh, what it is we're working, what we're trying to improve here. We're going to do some research. We're going to analyze that research. We're going to do some ideation exercises. We're going to prototype something based on our, our ideas. We're going to test it, and then we're going to send you away with some sort of way, like idea of what the implementation of this thing looks like. So this really isn't a development project. So. We tried that. We did some, some work similar to this where we tried to integrate it into our discovery process. And it ends up, you know, discovery was hard enough without adding some extra layer to it. So I really think the way to go with trying to do this stuff is to separate it from the discovery. And you send them off with a roadmap. You say, all right, well, now you know what you need, who you need to involve and what you need to do. Let's, uh, let's see what that looks like and go do any other work that needs to get done sort of after the fact. So. Um, the design challenge. So we've got a couple of tools here for setting up a design challenge. One of them is uh, that little board on the left. It's kind of a one sheet I call the UX canvas, which is sort of a rip off of what's called a business model canvas. Uh, that little blue corner, value proposition, relationship channels to users is from the business model canvas. Uh, and the sort of adaptation here is those UX questions, like what are your top three UX challenges? What are you currently doing? Uh, how are you tracking metrics? Uh, you got money, right? But that's those bottom <laughs> ones. Um, and then personas are another good tool for setting up a design ch uh, challenge. It's good for me on my end to understand, get knowledge from them and understand their users. Um, it helps me kind of, you know, and that, that UX campus really helps me also understand the department. Like, it's kind of a quick catch up for me. You know, all right, who are your users? What are you actually selling or offering? Uh, what kind of relationship do you imagine yourself having with your users? How do you get your stuff to them? And so this lets me catch up very quickly so that I can help them sort of frame a design challenge. Uh, which brings us to frame a design challenge. Uh, an exam design challenge. How might we make people feel confident that our help desk can quickly resolve their issues? So that's just sort of a sample design challenge. And we take, and we take a couple stabs at that. We, uh, Try and figure out what the ultimate impact. This, the design framing the design challenge is really just kind of a workshopping uh, session to figure out what that that uh, that looks like, what that design challenge would might be, would be, and you kind of can iterate through this stuff a little bit here, and you know identify constraints, context and constraints. You know, is there any reason we should or should be doing this, that, or the other thing? I know that's all very vague. Uh, research. So that next step after uh, the design challenge is getting some data of some sort. A lot of clients come to us, they have existing data, They're like, oh yeah, we already run a survey every time someone fills out a form. So they've got some big chunk of data. It's often just that, a chunk of data that hasn't been gone through, it hasn't been turned into reports. So uh, that's good data to then turn into a report that you guys can then look at and um, do the next phase, which is analysis on. But Usually, even if they have data, I like to do some sort of survey. Survey seems surveys seem to be a low bar for everyone. You start talking about focus groups and all, and other types of research avenues for um, for user experience stuff, and sometimes you can overwhelm the user, and they start thinking, "How expensive is this user group? Is this focus group going to cost me?" 
we, you know, most people have access to some sort of survey software, so that's usually the low bar to entry. Like, we need to get some data. Okay, what's the easiest way to get data? Let's build a survey, you know, and so a survey seems to be a good way to go. I like it. That's what we're doing right now. We also do something called professional interviews where we might say, well, Ted over there is a, one of your guys' big users. He uses your product, and he's there every day. He might, let's, talk, let's talk to Ted. So we'll pick, you know, a couple of people that either interact with whatever it is we're trying to improve or someone that might have subject matter expertise on whatever it is we're trying to improve. Maybe they're just a UX designer in another department and we just want to get their fresh look on it and, and ask them some questions. So that's just another easy avenue to, to start the research process. Uh, themes and insights. So this is the analysis phase. So after we've collected some sort of data, we analyze it and so we take all that data, usually I like to generate some reports that says 10% of people said yes, you know, 90% of them said no to whatever this question is. And then we can all sit down and say, all right, uh, what's the, th you know, this is what, here's a little graphic of this, the responses to this question. We try and come up with some sort of insight. Well, it seems like people are happier with green than blue. And then, you know, what's that theme? You know, maybe it's just UX interaction or UX, uh, uh, well, just reactions or something. So, so that's kind of the analysis phase. You kind of go through all your different data and, and do this sort of exercise where you find insights in your data and then you organize them into themes. Uh, and then the analysis phase, we also do these how might we statements where we pull out specific insights and we phrase that insight as a how might we statement. So if this is the insight, you just want to be assured that they're in the right place, taking the right actions. How might we help users feel more confident in their interactions with X? And, or how might we help people feel more confident in completing processes and actions? So, um, so yeah, it's kind of this sort of cyclical thing. You know, we've got this design challenge. This is kind of a how, how are we going to do this? And then we get some information, and we have an insight. And then we're trying to ask ourselves more questions. And those questions allow us to sort of sleuth our way through this process. You know, we're asking questions and we're answering those questions. Um, which brings us to ideation. So now, you know, ideally in this part of the phase, we should have some idea what our users, based on their feedback, you know, what, what are some of the problems our users are having, things that might uh, negatively affect their experience. And we can come up with ideas. So we do these big brainstorming sessions based on the, the how might we questions. And we say, all right, let's just come up with a whole bunch of answers to how might we do this, you know, and we'll come up with those and we'll vote on some of the best ones. And there's a gut check exercise to make sure that the, that the idea we've come with, come up with still aligns with our design challenge. And then we're sort of off to the prototyping phase. So then we can start, you know, we've got this idea, we want to prototype this idea and we want to bring it back to our users who gave us all this wonderful information. And so we can do some user testing. And once we have a prototype, you know, and there's lots of tools for building prototypes. We like Adobe XD for reasons I talked about earlier. Um, you know, I'm not going to go back into that, but that's what we use. It's great. I can get on a Zoom call with someone, throw them a link, and hit record, and we can just have a nice conversation and go through, uh, through the prototype together. And I can start to gather notes and insights. Or I like to usually not take notes during these user tests and just talk to people and then I can go back and watch the video and take notes later and that way I can be more present with them. All right, implementation. So the final step of this process is this sort of implementation roadmap, which is sending them away. This is a high level overview. I've done much more detailed roadmaps. Sometimes people want like down to the week, what are we doing this week, what are we doing that week? But you know, this is just something to send the client away with a deliverable saying, all right, here's what we prototyped, here are all the things that you should do to improve your experience, and here's the teams and the activities that are involved in completing this. So that was just a look at this process. Um, we're gonna take a look at uh, a client that we did this with recently called Aggie Service. They're kind of a, a, an HR helper service at UC Davis, so there's all these uh, organizations that handle different HR activities. Aggie Service is kind of like a central hub for uh, people on campus, whether, you know, it's for everybody, student, faculty, staff, the whole thing. And they can come to Aggie Service and say, I need help with this. And they can either point them in the right direction or they can start a case and get it sort of taken care of. But they wanted to go through this process before they spend a whole bunch of time developing because they've done that before and they always kind of end up with something they're not super happy with as far as the user experience. So they thought, this would be a good place to start this time around, which was a good choice. 
Uh, so, here's the deal. This is the presentation I gave them at the end, which, sh which shows all of the work that we did over an entire year. This presentation alone takes over an hour for me to deliver. I have it set as a video and it's going a little fast, so I'm going to try to cover everything here, but we're not going to slow down and talk about this tit for tat. So, here we go. Take a few deep breaths. <laughs> Alright. So, we kind of do through the same process. This is going to be a little bit of a repeat in some of this, but it's going to definitely go through some more of the details of the plan. It is. All right. So this is the team. I like to keep everyone all involved. All these people were in almost all of our meetings together, collaborating on this effort. So it was between three departments. Um, the departments were us, the the enterprise apps and shared services, which was them over there. You've seen this. This is the process overview. Um, we worked on our design challenge first, so understand the whole picture. You remember the UX canvas. We're going to go through, I guess I don't, yeah, I think I paused here to explain the UX canvas. We kind of explained that. So here's some uh, personas, again, just sort of goals and challenges for different personas for them. Uh, and then all of this, this is just the UX Canvas broken down, so these are us actually answering all the questions in that UX Canvas. Those are the metrics they use, those are the resources they have, and you can see all that stuff in one big canvas there. So again, good resource for sort of understanding an organization and their goals. So getting closer to our design challenge. Uh, they needed to answer some big questions in this project, so we took some time to kind of figure out who they were and what they're doing because they were kind of the client that's like, we want to target everybody and do everything. So uh, again, trying to frame our design challenge, taking stabs at what that might be, that kind of challenged us to go back and figure out who they were. Um, you can see we did a lot of work here, trying to state the ultimate impact we're trying to have, possible solutions, context and constraints, uh, second guessing it, and finally we had a design challenge. How might we inform, educate, and help UCDF's employees with resolution of HR processes? So that was our design challenge that we were trying to solve with this process. It's kind of a big goal, but I, you know, once you kind of narrow things down a little bit, it, it certainly helps. So they provided all this wonderful data. Um, we did a survey. So here's our, our sort of survey building process. Here's some example warm up questions, persona questions, HR service questions, ag service understanding. UX questions, and then kind of a participation and wrap-up question, any comments for us sort of thing. Um, we zoom through that, uh, but then we distribute that survey, uh, give it a few weeks. While we're, this is a good time actually in those few weeks waiting for those surveys to do those professional interviews. Um, but once we get all that back, we can, you know, there we go, professional interviews, talk to the subject. So uh, those are the, we talked to, it's like four people there, uh, and just some examples of us, you know, Again, this is me presenting this after the fact. There are documents that align with this presentation that have all the transcripts and everything from these interviews, so if they ever want to go back and reanalyze any of that. Uh, here's our looking for themes and insights in our data. So satisfaction survey, uh, right, so this is their yearly satisfaction survey. Uh, we can narrow that down because they had like 10 years of it. I was like, this year is the year that most people actually filled this out, so we took like the most dense set of data. Um, and then we did like the, in the insights process. We came up with insights and themes for those insights. We created insight statements after we did that exercise. So we came up with themes of community, uh, communication clarity, consistency, speed, confidence, resolution. So those were kind of our themes that we were trying to keep our insights into. And you can see that we have different insights under each of those headings. And then we get to anal analyze that. So we're gonna answer how might we for each of our themes there. So we've got insight, we create a how might we statement, uh, and then we had our sort of final how might we statements, because we came up with a lot of extra, a lot of extra stuff. Lots of big, big brainstorming sessions with clients. Um, so those were our sort of final how might we statements. I think ideally you want like one going into the ideation phase. They had more than one, which was funny because all of they really insisted on having multiple, which all sort of combined back into one idea at the end anyway. So it all worked out in the end. But um, here's us going through our how might we questions and coming up with ideas. And this is just a big brainstorming, no wrong answers, no crazy answers. Everyone's just, and then you organize those answers into most likely to succeed and most feasible um, or 
or no, most likely the seed and uh, what was the other one? Um, anyway, then we gut check it. Prototype. So again, here's just an overview of our prototyping. We did a couple a couple rounds of prototyping. Again, this is where our multiple how might we came together. This is an example of our prototype in XD, our first round prototype. You can see, you can kind of how the user would see it when they go around and they click around in there. And we've got some static pages where they just pretend they're logging in. Again, this isn't super interactive as far as like the form field, but it's interactive as far as the form process. And this, this product is really form driven. So we wanted as much feedback as we could about this, this uh, idea we came up for the, uh, this idea we came up with for this very iterative sort of step through form and eventually you know tracking your case in the system. Uh, so once we had that, we could actually go test it. Oh, this is our second round of testing actually. So once we kind of tested both, we had two sort of users we wanted to test. One was uh, sort of the everybody user, and one was like the HR people that are doing stuff on behalf of other people. So we did all this user testing. Oh, this is the first round. This is the everybody people. So we did all this user testing and got all these more more uh, data to run our, do our analysis on and insights and sort of say, oh, well, people seem to like this or didn't like this or couldn't find this or couldn't find that. Um, and then finally, we did this second round of prototyping to improve the entire portal, not just the forms, and so the form really became part of this portal experience. Um, and you can see by this point, we've got enough feedback about um, sort of graphic stuff that we started working in a little bit more realistic looking design. And uh, much like the other one, you can see you can kind of the, the second round of prototyping, we're able to click around and see different things, just like they're using it, you know, kind of, kind of got to set them up when you start these interviews. like. Just click around it like it's a real website. I know it's not, and, and but and talk about it while you're doing it. Tell me what you're doing. Like, oh, I want you to say, you know, oh, I'm clicking on the apply button because I'm pretty sure that will open an application form. And then I think I'm good here on the data, so I'll just hit next. And so you know, I try to get them to talk through what they're thinking while they're doing it. Um, but once we have, <coughs> let's see, student hire. All right. So this is me. Whoa. This is me talking about how we kind of ended up mashing these two, both the student hire recruitment form and uh, so we had, again, two different types of users. This is our more sort of HR oriented user, uh, someone who's doing student hire and recruitment type stuff. And so they went through the site with a different eye and looking at different things that we had prototyped. We had different scenarios, we set up scenarios and then ultimately we have all this data, we have all this user testing data um, and we brainstormed how to move forward and came up with this roadmap that was a very high level. And then of course there's a very detailed roadmap using a Gantt chart and like smart sheets uh, because the, the client liked the high level one for their, their presentations but they really wanted something much more detailed for actual implementation purposes. So um, in summary, these are the final deliverables they got at the end of this process. A big fat presentation, which you just saw. A detailed report, which was like a 90 page document that included all of our notes from all of our exercises and appendix files, which are there on the right. So that document links, does a good job of linking to like, if you're reading the part about the design challenge, it's got links to appendix 1.2, the design challenge like brainstorming. And so like all those reports are there, very easy to get to by going through that document. You, you, can, you can go through this presentation a year later and say, I remember that, I want to hear what people were saying. So you can go and follow the, find that section of the document and click on the thing and it'll take you to the, the archive and you can find all your data there. So that was, a, that was supposed to be like a three or four week uh, user improvement workshop it turned into a little over a year's worth of work and that's something that we're just learning along the way as we do these processes is that to have everybody involved in these sort of projects it just takes time people can meet maybe once a week you're going to have someone's entire team involved in something they're all off doing their, their jobs and so trying to do something like this takes time and so if everyone could meet every day of the week for three or four weeks, we could get it done. But the reality was that everyone could get together once, maybe once every other week to work on this. And so what was originally thought of as a two, three, maybe four week project turned into a year pretty easily. 
but we did a ton of work and we didn't go over budget. Even though it went much longer time, the amount of hours were no different. It just ended up being stretched out for, to get it all done. So that was good. And let's see what we do, do, do. So yeah, what the client walks away with, we kind of just talked about that, the detailed report. I have a nice little thing here of the showing sort of this, um, I work, we, I use Google Drive for this stuff. It's easy to share. Most people know how to use Google Drive files. So here's just an example of like the appendix files. You can see you can drill into many of our little sample, like early versions of the canvas. And you can see it's organized by, what's this one? This is a professional interviews. It got transcripts and video files if ever anyone wants to go back. I know like, I know Zoom saves these things, but this stuff, who knows when this stuff's gonna get wiped out. Try to, if you do something like this, try to save, put everything in one place. Try and track this stuff down, for, like asking the client to track all these resources down, especially when you've collected this stuff over an entire year is not cool. <laughs> so uh, I love this doc, it's just a Word doc, but you know, there's a little button you know, hit that says make an index and then every time you use an H1, it makes a title and so you can see there's all of our phases and every exercise, every one of those blue things is a link to a, to a section in this 100 and something page document that explains what we were doing that day or working on. So there's a ton of work here and you know, this whole process is supposed to be iterative anyway. You don't just like, we did it once, it's done. We're, we're, our UX is improved forever. So, you know, the idea is that you can go through a lot of this data and yeah, our design challenge was this, but the client can say, well, now we want to improve this and they can go back and look at that data with an eye for improving that other thing that they want to work on. Uh, so, you know, that's why I kind of put so much time and effort into tidying this all up into a nice little package to deliver to the client so that they can actually use this, continue to use this, or duplicate this process at some point if they want, you know, they don't necessarily need us. Yeah, it's nice to have somebody playing ringleader and telling them when to show up to meetings and stuff, but if they get someone motivated on their end that wants to go through this whole thing again at some point, they don't need, they don't need us. So, uh, what are we looking at now? Uh, this is just another example of, oh, this is an example of the links to those prototypes are also in this document. Again, making it as easy as possible for people. They can come down here to the prototype section and find all the links to the prototypes. I leave that stuff just published until my computer explodes. Uh, actually, they're going to be there whether my computer explodes or not. But um, and here's our roadmap in Smartsheet. I don't know if any of you guys use Smartsheet, but it's got cool tools for doing these sort of Gantt charts. You can see we've got all of the tasks list there on the left, and then uh, it's got fun little arrows that, I don't know if you see those little arrows that tell you like this process can't start till this one. So some of those processes can happen simultaneously. The ones with the arrows can't happen until something else is complete. So it's a, from a project management standpoint, it's, it's a good tool. We have departments in our, in IET that use this as their project. They don't use, they use this instead of JIRA. So uh, it's a good tool for sort of planning stuff out. And I liked it as a tool to present this to a client who may or may not have had some other software for, for, for planning this sort of stuff. All right. All right, so how do you build a UX process? So let's look at some ways we can sort of duplicate what we're doing here. So question, are you starting from scratch? Uh, do you have any an existing process? Do you have anyone in your team group or group with knowledge or experience? Do you have access to any tools or training? Maybe you have a UX some UX design experience, but not really UX research or UX strategy. So those are some places that you could get some knowledge to sort of put all together. Because when I started, when I got tasked with sort of building this process, I'm a solid user experience designer, but that's just design. People are like, we want user experience design. I'm like, well, that's just design. Like, I can make things that are that that I know are usable because people use them. But why do they use them? What are their fears? What do we? What 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 problem are we really solving with that? So that's where those other bits become important. So. Um, I recommend you learn as much as you can. Here's some good resources. I first thing I did go down to my local library and grab a, every anything that started with UX and read through a bunch of those. <clears throat> I'll tell you 
uh, there's a slide about this later, but one of the big problems I had reading through a lot of these UX strategy and research books is they all sort of assume you're, you're profit driven. They assume that like, oh, as long as uh, your user experience is driving up your, your bottom line, then you're doing it right. And it's like, well, that's not super helpful. Um, so, and then we did a course, me and a bunch of other people from IT just for, not just for fun, but to, to better our understanding of this stuff. We took a course at Acumen Academy uh, called Introduction to Human Centered Design, and it was a sort of hands-on thing, and before we took and made up our own design challenge and kind of went through a lot of this stuff. A lot of the stuff in this process I showed you is uh, picked out of this uh, guide to human-centered design that IDEO put together. It's free, it's online, you can download the PDF. If you want the hard copy, you gotta pay for it, but. That was a really good class. Yeah, it was a really good it class. Was free too, wasn't it? Free? No, I don't think so. No, it wasn't. It wasn't expensive. But it was cheap. Yeah. yeah uh, it might have been twenty bucks or something. Yeah, we paid a little bit for it, I think, but I think they were running discounts. Uh, but yeah, so as learn as much as you can. That's a good place to start. Do you have? What do you have? What do you need to learn? Uh, understand the landscape. So. That was something I didn't understand when I started, was like, I didn't realize there was a difference between UX user experience design and UX user experience strategy and research. So um, they're all very different and have different tools and techniques. So there's a lot of stuff to learn. I showed you just some of the tools, like out of the dozens of tools and techniques and exercises that I found in all of my research, like I had to just sort of pick and choose. And we gave, I gave a presentation in this room in 2019 about uh, you're going to build a process for that process, which is about our process for building processes. <laughs> so, like, and it's very much about, you know, what do you know? What do you need to know? How do you make this thing iterative? And then we did that with this process. We did, I tried these tools. They, some of them flopped, some were really successful. So that current process I showed you is based on what has worked over the last couple of times we've tried to implement this process. But that's what worked for me. Like, I don't know what, you know, something might work different for you or your organization. Right, that worked for the particular customers we were working with. And we work with totally different people, a different, a different customer. It also worked it would with- would be different, right? The tool, it may not just work for them no matter what it is. It also worked with the tools that we had available to us. Like, I tried to adapt and use things that also aligned with our existing tool sets so that I didn't have to ask for software or licenses. <laughs> uh, start with a data-driven iterative model. So, uh, whatever, you know, whatever process you start building for improving user experience that you want to do, or like whatever process you start working on, make it iterative. Re some sort of research, some sort of analysis, some sort of testing, repeat, you know, like I said, I showed you what's working for us and what softwares are using for us. You don't be married to XD for prototyping. Don't even be married to web development for prototyping. If you want to prototype by crafting with wool and felt, Craft your website in wool and felt, and show it to your show it to your user. Like, I, like there really is a million ways to do these things. Like, don't don't feel like you have to use what everybody else is using. Um, I always like to start with an outline. It's the lowest bar to entry. I could spend a month working on beautiful slide decks that I'm going to end up throwing out the first time I use them anyway because it, things work and things don't. So the first time I do any process, I only I don't do anything more than an outline. And that allows me to be much more flexible and for me to waste much less time over the, as that process progresses. Uh, pick tools for research and analysis. So, uh, again, lots of stuff here. Atrius personas, wireframes, competitive analysis, matrices, sales funnels, focus groups, insights. Like, there's so many tools for data research and analysis. You kind of just got to pick the ones that you think are going to get the best results and then try them and then find out whether they do or they don't. Uh, pick tools for, you know, you're going to need these tools. Something for file management and collaboration. You're going to be sharing files with clients. Uh, something for whiteboarding. You're going to be talking and needing to write things down. Uh, this, a lot of these processes are based on the old, I stand here with post-it notes slapping them on the wall. Here, have some post-it notes in my pen. So uh, as we all know, we rarely stand in a room with other human beings anymore. So Having a nice whiteboarding tool. Uh, InVision has one called Board or something. I like that. I use that sometimes. Uh, Figma has FigJam. Uh, there's a whole bunch of play, like tools, whiteboarding tools out there. Find one you like. Find one that's uh, that everyone can use at the same time. Like, and also 
So I like the Envision one because I just give them a link, they go to it. I think all a guest just has to put in an email address and pop, they pop in and they can start in, uh, collaborating on post-it notes. Um, Prototyping, again, Sketch, Envision, Figma, lots of tools for prototyping, uh, interviewing, Zoom works fine for us, that's a product we already have. You wanna use Teams, use Teams. Uh, user testing, again, if you wanna meet someone for coffee, go meet someone for coffee, but I would, if you do in person, I would recommend recording your session. Ask them, it's a cool video, don't just record people without their permission, but um, record it, because it's nice, like I said, it's really nice to just have a conversation with someone and then you can go through it afterward and make notes and stuff. Um, and then something for communication, so whether it's Slack or email, just try to be on the same page with whatever your, your communication of ch tool of choice is there. Does anybody still use Basecamp? I put that on there, but no? Okay. I saw they have a new like Basecamp 3.0. It looks, looks fancy. Uh, make do with what you have. Uh, it's an uphill climb. Has anyone ever had to do software purchasing? It's no fun. <laughs> uh, so if you got stuff, use it. I think we probably all have access to things like Google Docs. We should, most people should have some sort of access if you're doing design work to the Adobe Cloud, that's gonna include XD. I'm sure you guys have some access to some sort of conferencing software. Uh, Lucidchart is something I really like for wireframing. I've tried wireframing in Photoshop, or XD and some of these other ones. I get really hung up in, uh, Problem is, is the design tools are there, and it, it just, for whatever reason, Lucid Chart seems to be faster and less, I don't know, less distracting. Uh, I don't like introducing another system for them to log into and see stuff, but it is what it is. <clears throat> Fake it till you make it. Uh, so, go learn about UX research, strategy, and design. Pick some research and analysis tools. Outline that phase and meetings and exercises. So just make an outline of the meetings and exercises you want to have. Uh, find a client to go through that wants to improve something. Someone, anyone will do. Uh, make changes, you know, go through that process. Make changes based on that experience and find another client. You know, it's, we've done this three times, maybe? We did grad studies. I mean, we've only done it a handful. We did MIP. Mindful Vault, right. Mindful Vault, I think, was the first one, then grad studies, then ag service. And it, this process has changed drastically each time we do it. This is so far the best iteration. Uh, and I have been committing some resources to sort of solidifying this at this point. <clears throat> um, and then at that point, it's congratulations. You completed a UX process. You know, after you do that first one, ask yourself these questions. What went well? What didn't go well? Did the tools make collaboration easy? Was the client engaged and involved? I've had both experiences so far with clients that are just like, we're paying you, you do it. You know, and the, they and at some point you have to say, well, I guess you know, I got the data here, I can do it for you, but it'd be better if you were involved. Um, but that happens. <clears throat> uh, rework your outline, replace tools and exercises that didn't add value, make some slide deck. That's, of course, as this is going well, and you're starting to feel confident that you're you're getting the results you want, then you can start building some fancy materials like slide decks, and you can do stuff like write documentation. Uh, leading a UX process, so uh, the, yeah, you gotta, you, you kind of gotta be the ringmaster in some of this stuff. So um, you know, don't do all the work for them. I've done it; it's not not helping them. Um, this process only works when involved from the client and involved participants. So. Um, you know, in rare cases, I will step in and sort of do a little bit more of the work for them if they are just completely incapable, don't have the time, and they've already committed to this process and it's got to move on. But if it can possibly be avoided, don't make them be involved and make them make decisions and make them actually be involved in the process. And of course, you can make that easier by providing collaborative tools and being communicative and taking notes. And people are just so happy when you communicate. Send simple stuff send out take notes during the meeting send out notes afterwards so that everyone has like some action items or whatever and just make sure they know what they're supposed to show up with next week or next meeting plan the meetings at the end of the meetings so that people leave the meeting knowing when they are expected back to do this stuff 
Uh, the higher ed challenge. So I talked about this a little bit early, just assuming it's profit driven, like I really liked this tool, the competitive analysis matrix, what the idea was that you went and found similar products, that, like say you're trying to improve a, I don't know, restaurant rating software. You go find five or six other restaurant rates, uh, rating softwares, you go create accounts on all those things, you share them with your team, everybody goes out, there's some tools online that let you like scrape analytics from sites that aren't even yours, and so you then go look at their numbers and compare each one and see, well, they got, you know, the idea is that you're just trying to glean as much information from who's out there already doing it, so you're not reinventing the wheel and making mistakes that other people have already made. I like this. Didn't apply so well to higher ed. We tried this. The best part about this is there was a section in there that's like uh, influences. What is it called? The uh, uh, something influences, but it was like instead of comparing them to like success with their client base, you compare them based on like their influence, like UX influence. So like, for example, like with my info vault, uh, which was um, what is, what is my info vault do again? It's <laughs> very wild. Faculty merit and promotion system. Faculty merit and promotion system. We looked at Box as an influencer just because of the interface. So you know, it's very unrelated, but they were still providing an interface that was organizationally the same as the way they want to organize files for these faculty promotions. So, um, so never stop improving. Uh, write documentation for process, keep it up to date, says the guy who's in internal Logix process with he's a couple of years old. Uh, keep refining uh, the tools and exercises that work the best for you. Uh, update slide decks as, as the process evolves. You know, I, that's one of my favorite things is re-updating everything after things change because I hate having to go through a presentation and be like, we don't do that anymore, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> and, uh, Share your process with other UX people and get feedback. We've got UX people scattered all over the university. I try and keep a little network going and get people's feedback and ask and involve them in these things. Uh, they make good professional interviews when you're working with clients. Uh, the community, uh, there's lots of people in higher education that are doing this sort of work and there's like channels, I know there's channels, user experience, UX channels just in our UC Davis Slack, there's UX channels in the uh, UC Tech Slack. Um, I was trying to find some good stuff, there was some really good LinkedIn groups that seemed like they were really active, you could ask questions there and I was reading through some of those and saw some really, looked like really knowledgeable people giving really good answers and they were seemed responsive so Lots of places to go and learn. Uh, yeah, and then yeah, you take some of these courses online, good way to get involved with the UX community, but uh, yeah. And then UX events, there's from time to time, if you watch the UCIT blog, there's some events there. They'll post stuff like the UC Tech uh, events and um, Berkeley does like, uh, what's it called? What's your? Oh, it's the user Center design group, like, yeah. I forget what the actual you know, the actual thing is called. Yeah, they'll, I know. They'll do like case studies where they invite folks to come in and sort of witness yeah. and they live UX feedback. And they publish that in the in the UCIT blog as well. So uh, so yeah, a place to look for events. Um, oh, I'm going backwards. Alright. I don't know how much time we have because it was an hour. Two to three, maybe. Okay. okay, so I got lots of time for questions. I know I jammed through. People always want me to go back and show the um, the slide deck that we presented to the client. There, I can do that if you guys want, or we can just do open questions. Or does anybody have any questions? So, as far as surveys are concerned, like. Do you write the questions? Do you give the client guidance on how to write questions? It's a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, here, let's do this real quick. Um, I can show you, because I've actually started rewriting this process, so we can actually go through my slides for training someone to write questions for a survey. Let's see, so client engagement, approval process 22. Let's see, that would be research phase. Uh, 
There we go. So the research phase. I was hoping to have had all these done to share with you guys by bad camp, but they are not all done. I've gotten through kickoff meeting, uh, design challenge meeting, then workshop, research and analysis. I don't still have to do prototyping and roadmapping or something, but uh, user testing. Anyway, uh, so you know, this is just sort of my slide deck I've been putting together for walking someone through the um, through the, oh goodness, the uh, animations are still in this, okay. Um, the research phase, so just an idea of where they're at in the process. Uh, creating a survey, so here's your task. You want, you want, we want to write some warm-up questions. We want to frame questions that tease out users' hopes, fears, and ambitions. I know that's always, a, people are like, what does that mean? Um, but you know, I try to explain it like this to people like, just because you're getting the amount of people clicking on what you want them to click on doesn't mean they weren't lost or irritated that they had to go through whatever they did to find it. So, like, you want to find out what irritates them. Like, ah, you know, if, if you do a bunch of survey stuff and people just, no one can stand going to the footer to look for information. Don't put information in the footer. So, um, you know, you want to you want to phrase things in a way that helps sort of tease some of these things out. Um, Finalize questions and build quality so uh, Finalize questions, of course, draft out a bunch of questions. Uh, or those questions and section schemes come up with distribution list right. So those are the tasks that this meeting is supposed to tackle. So starting out with warm up questions, uh, they're intended to be sort of icebreakers, but uh, pop, but it's possible to gain even from our icebreakers. You know, you find out that you know most of your people are cat people. You know, you might be able to derive something meaningful from that. I don't know. Uh, you know, like even as a hot dog a sandwich, I, I like to feel like if 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 everyone says maybe or like the majority of our users say maybe, I like to feel like that we have a user base that's a little bit more creative and we might be able to you know. People that like to think outside the box. So it's like, all right, well, if they're if they're thinking outside the box here, maybe they do in their user experience or they're you know they're searching too. Um, I like to write you know focus on a section of the survey that works on persona questions. So um, just figuring out who your users because sometimes your users aren't who they think they are, sort of you know what I mean? Or like, yeah. So you know, are you in fact you know if this is going out broad or not? I don't know. So, you know, is it, are you food student, faculty, or staff? You know, are you a supervisor? Is your job related to X? You know, how many years have you been with the UC? The institutional knowledge will tell you something about your user base for sure. Uh, I know that was important in this one. It was like, well, people that have been here for 30 years kind of don't care whether there's a website or not. They just know who to email, you know? <laughs> so, uh, design challenge questions. Write some questions, a specific challenge. So this is walking through, um, uh, so we want to write some questions that are related to our design question set challenge. So if our if our design challenge is how might we uh, get people on campus to give more high fives, we might say things like, "Are you comfortable? You know, how comfortable on a on a Likert scale? How comfortable are you giving high fives?" More, you know, so uh, so that certainly some a section on that. Uh, we did like three different sections. So that this this one, the design challenge questions, can be a bunch of questions you guys come up with, and you can certainly organize those into sections of the survey. And you might put them on separate. You know, you with surveys you can kind of paginate them and go through them in steps. So you might have three questions that are about <coughs> people's preference for user experience, and maybe three that are related to the design challenge, and maybe uh, three questions that are sort of related about. Uh, you, this is the more open part of it. I like to do some sort of participation and wrap up questions, just like an open field. You never know what people are. Like. People are. These as the surveys are usually anonymous, and you should see those stuff. Some of these UC people, right? I thought you, I thought you people were nice. Like, <laughs> there's some. You don't nasty. have any chances to some grievances. <laughs> yeah, they're like, ooh, anonymous. anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> Let them have it. Right. I've had some ones that are just like, this whole survey is stupid. I hate that you made me go through it. It's like, I didn't make it. It was a voluntary survey. Um,
So yeah, and then once you have all those questions, you can see, uh, I, we, sometimes we use like a spreadsheet and that makes it nice to tab it out. And I like to write it out so that we kind of have the question, what type of field they want to use for it. Do they want to use a Likert scale or radio buttons or, you know, Qualtrics has all kinds of fun stuff. You can use a heat map, you can put an image up and have people click where you think, where do you think the, the, where do you think the About Us page is? And they can click, and then in the report, you can show a little heat map that shows where people clicked and stuff by the most. Uh, so lots of good stuff there. I also like to put the reason we're trying, like what's this question actually trying to get at, sort of, so that when the client writes it out, they say, I'm ask this question because I want to know whether or not we should put the search in the header. Like I kind of want to know why the client's asking a little bit, and that way I can review them with that in mind. So uh, to, to answer this question specifically, oh, sure. they, you, you try to get the client, like the, the, the owners, to write the questions, and then we'll help them. Yeah. Kinda I usually do this kind of like a workshop where we go through these slides, and, I, and we, might, we, might, we, might, we might do a handful of questions, but then I want you to go and come back with, whatever, with, a, whole, with a whole final set, and then we'll talk about it and organize them, and then I'll, I'll usually go put it in Qualtrics because I know Qualtrics, so. Um, There's an art to write survey questions to get the answers, not the specific answers you're looking for, but getting the detailed enough answers that you can use real data or you can use it as real data. Right? And without leading them, I'm assuming, in the direction that you want right. them but, to go. Yeah, but you can still start by thinking about what kind of answer you want. Like, and I like how you mixed it up with the, the how might we, because that's the state, that's the answer that you're looking for, right? And so whether it's A or B or C, it doesn't matter. What you don't want is an answer to you know, form the question so the answer comes back with, yeah, I mostly like B, but C's good too. So well, darn it, that doesn't, that doesn't help at all. <laughs> I really, I'm, not the, I'm not a master at this by any means, but I do review all the questions to see if it's just phrased negatively or positively or neutrally. Like I want to keep things as neutrally phrased as possible. I don't want to charge it either way. Um, you should hear some of these interviews like, should, should I click there? I don't know, should you? <laughs> like, like people try so hard to get me to tell them the right answer because they so badly want to have the right answer to everything. They're like, am I doing it right? I don't know, are you? Like, I, like these interviews, in fact, I've had that. I did one of these with another user experience designer and she was like, you did such a good job of not leaving me. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, it's, it's hard. It's hard and it's an art and it's something I'm certainly working on. But. Um, yeah. Actually, I guess piggybacking off sure. of that as far as surveys, like, I, the unit I work with I think has some fears that if we were to survey users that we would be setting unrealistic expectations possibly because like by, you know, by saying let's open this up that then they might expect that every single suggestion that they give or every answer will then get implemented. And they want to be able to make sure we manage those expectations if we're going to even introduce that at all. And I'm wondering if you have any. I am familiar with this fear the fear that you are going to tell me, the CEO, what to do with data. <laughs> like, that, that, that is how us as, as people low on home have gotten our voice and our power in making good decisions in the design world and in, in, in the higher education. And it has a backlash, which is it terrifies people at the top when they're going to be told. You don't know, you don't get to make the decision because the users have made it for you. Oh, okay. Like, and tough, I don't know, it's a tough one. I don't know what the solution to that is except for just trying to console them and say, look, we're just gathering data, we're doing research, and we can make it this, we ultimately, we get to make the decision on what gets done and what doesn't get done. Um, and good example, I also run into like survey fatigue with, yes. with, I get clients that are just like, if we survey, if we make another survey and send it out, I'm getting fired. <laughs> like, and, and like that happened with Aggie services and I said, they said we have data. I'm like, yes, but you have data that was collected for a different purpose. Like, and we can use that data and we get insights from that data. But we need to ask some other questions because you have holes in, in the answers. Like there are things we need to know that we need to ask. And so they allowed me to make a survey, but they kind of didn't give me a distribution list. They gave me like a handful of people I could include, but as their user base was all of UC Davis, I kind of just went to the UC Davis general Slack and was like, 
hey, you guys should you want to help us, you know, improve some stuff on campus, come check out this survey. This is what we're trying to do. Here's like I did a whole little here's the goal, you know, just so you understand the context, you know, and you know, all you gotta do is go through this thing and answer a couple questions or whatever. And we didn't get a you know Ideally, you get this gigantic data set that allows you to like make some really quality um, decisions and you know get some really quality insights. But sometimes you just don't have the data set you want, and you kind of got to go through it and get what you can from it. And, and, and the problem with the Aggie service is that they have an annual survey that they send out for like the whole department, like the whole shared service center, and then it sends out to the whole campus, and they really want to get all this feedback, and then. So they, they then they hired us to do the that, the specific HR piece, but they had just sent that survey out, like just like two weeks earlier, and they're like, we can't send out another survey to everybody for one. This and one whenever anybody fills out a form on their website, it prompts them to fill out a survey. Yeah, and, right. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's it. You run into constraints and roadblocks and stuff, and you just figure your way around it and. And uh, my light has turned blue. Apparently, it's tired of listening to me. <laughs> or, it's, or, or it's out of date. So, do I have any, any uh, anybody have any more questions? Is anybody doing some sort of user experience improvement process? The way we used to do it was like, give me your analytics, and I'd go through all their analytics, and I'd be like, hmm, nobody's people keep going in a circle over here between these three pages and never getting anywhere, and then leaving. And I would just sort of give them a list, laundry list of like, you should do this because this seems obvious. Or go look at like the flow map. It's like, everybody's entering the site through this page. You know, maybe you should do something different. No one ever goes to the home page. I wonder why. So we, we used to do that sort of thing, but it was more reactive than proactive. And this is certainly more proactive. It's, it's nice to start a pro like this is all before any design or develop, develop design or development happens so I mean this I mean there's a little bit of design in there but um, I even told the client that like yes we did made all these pretty pictures but you need a designer come and design a system that can then be implemented like I did this, the components I needed to do these mock-ups for some forms like you're missing a ton of stuff here so um, yeah. that's it thanks everybody for coming with us